Grab your Bible, if you will, and open it Hebrews chapter 2. We are continuing in our series in Hebrews. No one like him. Hebrews is a, a marvelous, marvelous document. And as you know, it was written at a time to some people who were thinking very hard about maybe wandering off into something else, something they thought they would exchange for, for the gospel. They wanted to go back to life the way it was. They wanted to go back to what they thought was consistent. They wanted to go back to something that was a little bit easier. At least it seems easier. Rules and law and custom and ceremony always seem easier on the surface. But they turn out to be pretty bankrupt. But that's, that was the appeal. That was the appeal. And so this letter is written, uh, of course, we're not supposed to say that Paul wrote it, but, you know, we'll... <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, uh, marvelous, marvelous thing. But this, this morning, uh, as you know, we've been, we've been working our way through chapter 2. And uh, 2 seems to be an important number for this congregation. I'm not sure why. But we've actually gotten through uh, verse 2 a couple of times here. But we've been, as you know, for the last couple of weeks... Um, we got sort of hung up on verse 11. I make no apology for that. Verse 11 is one of those anchor verses for my life. And I think it should be an anchor verse for just about everybody's walk with God. It lays out some basic things for us and, and sets us on a course that I think is really important. Um, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit here, but have you guys ever have you guys ever thought about what we used to call the Christian roller coaster? You know what that is. It's you're you're climbing up, you're getting better, things are getting good, and I'm really I'm walking with God, things are going really well, and it kind of reached this crest, and then you know it's a roller coaster, and so then there's this decline down the other side, and it can be kind of scary because you know I thought I was doing so well here, I thought I thought. I thought I was walking with God, and now I'm, you know, I'm now I'm in, a, I'm in a trash bin again. How did I get here? Or I'm reading my Bible and I'm praying, and things are coming together, and then and I'm down this slope again. Now you don't have to give a show of hands, but um, am I the only one in here that's that struggled through that? Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep coming to meetings, Dave. Keep going to meetings. So, <laughs> but it's very, very frustrating. I mean, we can laugh about it. We can poke fun at ourselves and, and enjoy that because we're all kind of there. But when you're in the middle of it, we look at ourselves and we see this lack of consistency. It's not only, it's not only sad it's not only disappointing, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Because it leaves us vulnerable to accusation. It leaves us vulnerable to the question of, am I really serious about this? Does God really love me? Has he noticed me? Does he see me? Am I saved? I was trying not to sneak up on that too hard, but there, <laughs> but, um, but you picked up the thought, so thank you. I, I hear that amen. I hear that amen. But that's, that's what it leaves us open to, isn't it? That's why it's kind of scary. Sometimes that downward slope can throw us into a space where we wonder, is, this, is any of this really true? I'm sure I'm the only one in the room that's ever dealt with that. Hmm, nervous laughter. <laughs> So what I want to show you is we've, we've talked about some of the theology. We've talked about the exposition that's the, you know, going through the detail of these verses. And we're going to do a little more of that. But I want to show you some of the implications of what comes out of chapters of verses 211 to 13. And really what's here are the seeds that you need to get off the roller coaster and start leveling out some of those highs and lows and keep them more consistent. Is that of interest? Okay, then let's pray first and we'll jump in. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look into your word, your wonderful word. And Lord, as we, we've gathered this morning expecting something special from you, 
You never let us down. You never disappoint us. Thank you for a chance to look into your word. And Lord, I pray that you will show us what we need to know in order to walk with you consistently. So we thank you for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, back to verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason he, who's that? Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. I would love to go off on that verse again, but um, the sun will go down and um, we will have to move on. But I just want to touch on this because I have, I have, we've gone through this in some detail before, but just to touch on the, the basic threads here, that the one who sanctifies, sanctify is a fancy word that means holy, right? So if this is someone who's making you holy. And in the context, we know that this is Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes you holy. So he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, who's that? Us. Us. Are all from one father. Now there's some, some um, linguistic things here. And so you, you kind of have to kind of have to figure out who's the one that he's talking about, but in the context and the way it spreads out, it has to be the Father. It's, it's very clear. It has to be the Father. And so both Jesus and you are from one Father. How can that be? Well, we've talked about that. It's because we share his life. When we came to Christ, we were crucified, buried. What came next? We were the resurrection. We were raised with him to What? newness of life. So he gave us this life within us. We got that life from Jesus. And we know from John chapter five, that as Jesus was incarnated, you know, fully God becoming fully man, that life he got was the same life that the father had in himself. When you pass your life on to your kids, that's what makes them your kids, right? They have the same life from the father. Was that a tough concept? You guys like stalled in a little bit. You, you have dads, right? Boy, oh, it got really quiet. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> anyway, this is really all we're looking at. It's that simple. It's really that simple. That Jesus, our Savior, and you, we share his life. We are from the same Father. And so that puts us in a very interesting position. Because then, for which reason, he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. I remember just a verse before, he said it was, it was fitting for God, it was fitting for the Father to perfect the, the author of our salvation through suffering. It perfected him. He suffered. For, why did he have to suffer for that? Because justice had to be served. There had to be a price paid. And he paid that full price for us. And that completed his mission. It's not that, it's not that something was, was missing with, with Jesus, like he wasn't enough yet, but his mission had not yet been completed as a mediator. So when he suffered for us, he paid that full price for us, the full price. And that's why we go to the bottom of verse 11, and he says, he is not ashamed. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden... When they sinned, one of the first things that they said to God, after God's, you know, God's in the, he's, he's in the garden. Adam and Eve are dis, have disappeared. They've gone and, and made aprons for themselves to cover that part of their bodies where life is passed on. Think about that. And so, God, God says something really interesting. He says... Isn't that marvelous? I'm not sure that was an amen, but I'll take it. So, but God says something. It seems kind of interesting. God's in the garden. He's looking for Adam and Eve. And he says something. That it's, every once in a while, God says something that seems kind of dumb. He says, Adam, where are you? Like he doesn't know. Right? Adam, where are you? And he comes out and he says, um, why were you hiding? And they let him know. They let him know for the first time they're experiencing shame. We knew that we were naked 
and we hit ourselves. See, the chapter just before that, they were not ashamed. The man and his wife were naked in the garden. They were not ashamed. They could just show up. Now, that's not a fashion statement. That's about relationship. Moses doesn't take us to, and they, were, and they, they had lived in a really comfortable climate. I, I suppose they did. It doesn't, it doesn't say, and they had no need for material things. It doesn't say that. It takes them to this biting, stabbing, grinding emotion that holds us back. Perhaps the most painful emotion we experience. It's probably neck and neck with grief. Shame is an excruciating emotion and people will do almost anything to avoid it. But we carry an enormous amount, truth be told, if we're honest with ourselves, we carry an enormous amount of shame out of our life into the presence of God with us. Do we not? I am not good enough. I have failed you. I have disappointed you. Aren't you sick of this by now, God? And then God will say something that might be kind of silly. He would say something like, what are you talking about? Why is that? Why would he respond that way? Because we would just stare at him like, you know, like the dog that you're saying something and they have no idea what you're talking about and they just kind of... <laughs> Either they don't know what they're talking about or that's a comment on what we just said. It may be a comment. Dogs are smart. But we would say this to him. Aren't you sick of this yet? And he would say, what are you talking about? For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason Jesus is not ashamed of you on your worst day. He might lovingly say, I think you're missing something here. It's paid for. I took care of that so that I can be close with you and you don't have to withdraw from me. Now, is that a license to sin? What a ghastly thought, right? No, it's not a license to sin. But it is something of a guarantee. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, how do we get off? What does that have to do with the, the, the Christian roller coaster? It forms the foundation to level out those highs and lows. Actually, the lows. We'll bring it up. How's that? Because aren't, aren't you tired of you walk with God looking like the stock market? You know? You're not really sure, is this up or down? Because if we're not ashamed, if he is not ashamed of us, then we don't need to be ashamed in his presence. Even when we fouled up, if we don't need to be ashamed, then we can draw close and stay close. How else do we grow? How else do we walk in the Spirit? How else can we be successful on our walk with God if we are so ashamed and so embarrassed of ourselves, we are constantly withdrawing and hiding from Him because we think He's going to be critical or, or withdraw from us? Do you see the implication of this verse here? It forms the basis for us to be in his presence and not be afraid. We can come boldly into with confidence into his presence before the throne of grace. Notice it doesn't say the throne of impatience or the throne of what did you do with the last grace I gave you? <laughs> it, it, is, it isn't the throne of, of, of impatient toe tapping. What now? And I know some of your dads were like that. Some of you had parents who were never pleasable. But with Jesus, because he is the one who sanctifies, we can come into his presence with boldness and we will find help and grace in time of need. Oh, well, let's get this cleaned up. That's almost sermon enough, isn't it? How much does he love you? 
how effective was the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know the verse. For it is the power of God for salvation. He pulled it off to everyone who believes. Wow. But that lays the basis. This is why Peter had to have Jesus come to him on a special trip. Peter denied Jesus three times, right? And in that culture, you say something once, you better mean it. Say it twice, it's emphatic. You say it three times and you've raised it to an absolute. I don't know the man, I don't know the man, I don't know the man. And so Jesus made a special trip. Peter, do you love me like God loves you? No. But I love you like a friend. Because that's all he could conceive of. Are you with me on this? He couldn't imagine this. Peter, do you love me like God loves you? Lord, I told you. This is the Dave Lucer translation. I I told you I love you like a friend. Peter, do you love me as a friend? Now he's upset. He's misunderstood what what Jesus is about. I've I've told you this. You know all things. I'm at least loyal to you as a friend. Peter, you're going to give your life for me. You're going to be crucified for me. Is that just phileo, love of a friend? Is that all that is? Oh. Jesus wasn't criticizing him. Jesus was showing, I'm not ashamed of you. You love me with your whole soul and all your heart. I'm not ashamed of you. Wow. Both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call you family. Wow. So we don't have to withdraw. We can stay close in contact, touching. Don't let him get out of reach. So both Jesus and the born again you are all from one father. Jesus is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to call you brethren. And that's the first first thing we need to know because that roller coaster is, is largely driven by shame. It's driven by shame and fear, a lot of it. That's what you get for hiring a therapist. So releasing shame then, releasing shame, daring to step through that, It is a tissue of lies, to borrow an old phrase. (laughs) To step through that allows you to stay close to him. Challenge the shame. Stay close. And that starts flattening out this roller coaster. Now, verse 12, he goes on saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. It's the reference to Psalm 22. Now, do you remember what Psalm 22 is about? We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Psalm 22 is the description from about 1000 BC, maybe 950 BC of the crucifixion. It's, It's a description of that long before crucifixion was even invented. And it describes the crucifixion. When you get to verse 22, he's talking about, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. And he's separating the people who belong to him, who are believers from those who are those, those dangerous cows of Bashan that have surrounded the cross and are, are, are murdering him. So after that, he is going to proclaim his name to the brethren. And he goes on to say that the truth of God is going to be screened from those people that have rejected him, but will be exposed to those who have accepted him. You follow me on this? And so there's this remnant, this this chosen people out of all the the religiosity out there, what we would say all the churchianity, the real real people with genuine faith are the the ones that God continues to reveal himself to. And so I will proclaim your name to the brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And from this song, Jesus is referenced 
uh, rest from the cross. And really it's, we could almost print on that. He who has ears to hear, he who has eyes to see, let him hear, let him see. Because that's what he's getting at. There'll be people who will be able to hear and see, but those are the ones, those are the ones that have his life. Those are the ones that he's not ashamed of. He reveals himself to us. The congregation are, is simply those who have genuine faith. And it's interesting, the, the context again, we don't have time to go through Psalm 22, I wish we did. But so you just, just read it, you'll see it's, it's, it's really very plain. But in Romans chapter 11, verse 4, it talks about, and, and verse 11 also, it talks about how faith has come to the Gentiles. Do you remember why? To make the, the, the nation of Israel jealous that we have something they don't have. I think it's very interesting that a lot of Jews celebrate Christmas, but don't give that away. It's kind of a secret. And so, so they know we have something. They're beginning to figure this out. And it's, it's really exciting to see uh, so many Jewish people are coming to Christ most recently. So it's, it's really very exciting. Uh, that, you know, so <laughs> maybe it's good to get off the, the roller coaster now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to be at the top of it when the rapture hits. So anyway, I like that would make much of a difference because it's all about his glory anyway. But anyway, but I'd rather, you know, if I had to choose, if I had to choose, yeah, yeah. I'd rather be on the, the bull, not the bear market. So anyway, but what this, what this does is it draws us into worship. I will, proclaim, I will proclaim your name in the congregation, in the midst of, of, the, of the brethren, in the midst of this congregation. I will sing your praise. So it's in the midst of them. The, the implication here is that they're participating with it. They're catching on. And so as, as Jesus is able to stand in the midst of us and reveals himself to us, because we are not withdrawing from him in shame, then we are caught up in this worship of him. Now, we are, we are not a, 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 a fancy or the, probably the, the coolest church in town. Ask me if I care. What I like, about what? I forget. Yeah. yeah. Oh, probably not. Yeah. Thanks for the help. Anyway, <laughs> we're pretty simple. But what I enjoy about us is the sincerity of it. I made kind of a joke about after the first song we sang this morning, you know, we sing the hits. You didn't get that, huh? I got it. Okay, thanks. Moving on. Anyway, but it's, it's, the, it's the depth of those, those songs. And one of the things I like, I, I, was, I, was, really, I was really encouraged. Um, uh, one of the brothers came to me and said, you know, I was, I was visiting another church and we're singing all those, and I'm not putting anybody else's music down, okay? But we're singing all these other, you know, kind of contemporary worship songs and stuff like that. And he says, well, I found myself kind of missing singing a song that had some real substance to it. Some depth that makes you think, that makes you sit. Even if it's a really familiar song you've sung a thousand times, it's one of those songs that you see this thought and somehow it draws you into, into the presence of God and makes you see something in scripture maybe you hadn't noticed before. We try very hard to do that here. We don't want to waste your time. We have very little time. And so we want to go deep with that. And so as Jesus is in us and in this congregation and he praises the Father in our midst, he catches us up with him and we worship along with him. That's part of what the Holy Spirit does with us. Now the Spirit's very quiet. We know from John 14, he doesn't draw attention to himself. He draws attention to... Jesus. And I hope that that's a mark that we're walking with the Spirit well here. We'll find out, I guess, eventually. But for now, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's really honoring and worshipful of how, how central Jesus is to us. Lots and lots of churches. I'm not saying we're the only one. But that is a sign of a healthy church. So, anyway. So we have to worship. If, if the very life within us is, is calling attention to the Father and proclaiming his name within us and within us as, as a body, individually and collectively, then, then we have to worship. 
See, worship, worship builds an intimate attachment. You might have heard somewhere that the most fundamental human drive, even more than survival, is to be attached in an emotionally safe relationship. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. And in emotional safety, you know the rest of it? Very, very close. Love comes in, love goes out, and love heals. Thank you. Worship is a very intimate experience, is it not? What is intimacy? How would you define intimacy? So I told you it's, it's your fault for hiring a therapist. Intimacy, intimacy is the ability to pass emotion back and forth between you people. That's really all it is. There are lots of definitions out there, and some of them are pretty, pretty hoity-toity, but I really like that one. I see your heart, and you see mine, and we connect through that. It's the ability to pass emotion back and forth. Isn't that the heart of worship? He loves us more than we can know. And when we make the attempt to pass some of that love back, to express some of our, 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 our worship, our, our, our appreciation of him, how, how he, he leaves us in awe. Isn't that passing a pretty, pretty straightforward emotional statement back to him? Yes, we love you. Intimacy then builds connection. Attachment is formed through shared emotional experiences. And we are created to be attaching beings. This is why Jesus was asked by this lawyer and the way Jesus answered the way he did is the greatest commandment is, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's a reciprocal relationship, isn't it? We love him because he first loved us, yes? And the second commandment is like it. They're about, about the same. The second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that a reciprocal relationship? No matter how hard I love you, no matter how much I expend myself to love you, I got news for you, brothers and sisters. You're supposed to love me back. I didn't say that was going to be easy, but you're going to have to love me back. See, a lot of the Christian life, really, I throw this in here, a lot of the Christian life is making it easier for other people to love you. It's hard enough. Make it easy for them. Behave yourself. Isn't that what a lot of holy living is? Love does no wrong to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So those, those, those loving exchanges back and forth build attachment so that we need each other and we're more dependent on each other. If we're not withdrawing in shame and we're beginning to worship, now we are exchanging emotion back and forth and that builds the attachment between us. To put it simply, love deepens. Can you see how that would tend? Because as, as love deepens, then I draw my heart closer and closer and closer to him and I want to be with him more. That flattens out these curves of the roller coaster. You with me on this? I mean, it, it's not as easy as go do this, one, two, three. But it's not complicated, is it? We are nurturing, we are cultivating a, a living, active, loving relationship with a God who loves us more than we can even comprehend. Of course he's going to respond to that. So that's the second part. Verse 13. And again, I will put, he's, again, he says, it's again and again and again here, right? And so again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. So he's clumping us together in this. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter eight. And uh, let's look at that real quick. Isaiah chapter eight. Now this is, you know how the, you know how the Hebrews think? They, they want to give you just a little snippet and you're supposed to remember the whole context. Must be nice to know your Bible that well. Something to work on, huh? Anyway, so he gives you this little snippet. And really, we'll pick up in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 13. Because this is really the whole context. And we'll go down to the bottom of the chapter. We talked about this last time we worked on this. But I just want to refresh this. Verse 13. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. And he shall be your fear. And he shall be your dread. Not those other idols out there. That's what was going on in the context. 
Then he shall become a sanctuary, both to you, to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. There's opposition. Bind up the testimony. I hear this in verse 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among the disciples. Among who? The disciples. Here again, we see God's explaining himself, God's revelation of himself being withdrawn from those who reject him and being kind of sequestered over to those who are following him. It's brought into the disciples. It's kept for them. You know, like in John 14, again, he says that, that he who keeps my commandments, he's, he's the one who loves me. And I will love him and my father will love him and, and we will make our, our home with him and I will reveal myself. I will, I will explain myself to him. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among the disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Behold, I and the, there's our, voice, our verse, behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel, for the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. So here again we see this, this, this parallel theme. The same thing that's going on in the book of Hebrews is. Israel as a nation had drifted away from God. They'd gone to their own, their own man-made religion. Different religion. Here it was Baal worship. In the, in the book of Hebrews, they were deciding to go back to this legalism, basically using the law as, as an idol and, and completely withdrawing from God, just doing all the do's and the don'ts. It's an idol. But it's the same end. There's no life in the law. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists and the whisperer and the mutterer and the law and the Mishnah and the Talmud, should not the people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony. Get back to your Bible. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. There's no light coming over the horizon for them. They will pass through the land hard pressed and famished and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. Not to be too smart alecky, but have a nice day. <laughs> really dark at that point. It's really dark. Israel had been on this terrible roller coaster. They would have these short periods where they would walk close with God and then they would descend quickly into idolatry and legalism. And it happened over and over and over and over. And so God is telling them this, basically the same message, how to get out of that. Go back to your Bibles. Go back to coming to know me as, as I am. Not as it's, as it's described in self-made human religion. So what, what's going on here, I'm going to pick up verse 13 again. That was just for free, okay? Verse 13 says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. So he's talking about whose trust do, are we putting our life, whose hands are we putting our life into? This is the core of this. This is the third thing that, that flattens out this, this uh, roller coaster and helps you get off it. We got to get away from the shame. We have to worship and build an intimate relationship with God. But we also here, we have to trust him. That is such a vague thing. And we talk about living by faith and we, 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 we spill this out in church all the time. And you know, after a while, if you've heard something over and over and over and over, we kind of forget that maybe I don't actually know what that means. What are you talking about? Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, just turn it over to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Just lay it at the foot of the cross. What does that mean? How do you do that? This will sound too simple. You let let God set the agenda for your day. 
Now he's quoting out of Isaiah here and it says, I will put my trust in him. Now, um, we, we, we know that Paul relied on the Septuagint. That's the translation that's here. Of course, we can't be sure if Paul wrote this letter. But I will put my trust in him. But when you look at the direct translation from Hebrew into English, it comes out, I will wait for the Lord. I will put my trust in him. I will wait for the Lord. So what happened with the Septuagint is they interpreted it a little bit for us so we'd know what that meant. I will put my trust in him when it says, I will wait for him. And what that really means is, it's not that you're sitting around in your hands waiting for God to do something. You know, our, our nation is, is, is literally going to hell in a handbasket. Can I say that in church? But this, I mean, if, if, any, if any culture has sought out evil and wickedness, it is ours today. And so as this has proceeded, we find ourselves in this horrible mess and a lot of churches have simply sat on their hands and done nothing, wanting God to come and rescue them. That is not what this means. I will wait for the Lord. He will set an agenda for you. Have you noticed you have plenty of contacts and plenty of things to do through your day? There are a lot of people that you get to talk to. There are a lot of situations that you can apply the life that you have in Christ into that situation. You can inject yourself as a living being into those, those situations. God is already setting the agenda for you. Blackaby, a while back, had a whole book study on this, Experiencing God. It was, it was an amazing, really enlightening kind of thing. About you, you look around, you see what God is doing, and you go do that. He will set the agenda. That's all that means. It doesn't mean sit on your hands and do nothing. It doesn't mean be passive. It means allow him to set the agenda. That what comes along in your day, happy or sad, is what he wants you to deal with today. That's the first part of learning to trust God and, and, and walk with him in faith. God knows what he's doing. He's bringing things into my life that are supposed to be in, li in my life that he wants me to do. So this leads us then that I will do nothing in my own strength. I will, uh, I will rely on God to act. Those who wait are the remnant of the believers. And so this is a very apt, this is a very apt statement given the theme of Hebrews. Wait does not mean passivity. It means dependence. I want, I, this is where I didn't get the last time. Jesus lived by faith as the author, the captain, the founder, the leader, the model of, of our faith. We talked briefly about Jesus being tempted in the desert. Remember that? And Satan came and tempted him. How did Jesus answer? With scripture every time. All three times. Even when, when the second time, when, when Satan tried to twist the words that, that that same God he was talking to right there, um, had already spoken those words. He tries to twist the guy's words that he had already, that's amazing to me. What, what, I mean, that's chutzpah. That, re that really is. But Jesus doesn't answer with an argument or cleverness. He just responds with scripture. He responds with truth. And even though we may not realize, we may think that I need something more clever. I need to win this argument. I need to be on top of this. I need to, I need to defeat these people. That may not be God's goal right now. Part of God's goal is allowing evil to burn itself out. It allows evil to harm itself into oblivion. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all those who suppress the truth of, of unrighteousness. We get upset when we think we see all these bad things going on in life and we think God isn't, God isn't acting. He's, he's exactly acting. And so he doesn't answer with fleshly weapons. He answers with spiritual weapons. He answers with the Bible. He answers with a simple answer where the, the first temptation is really telling, if, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus, you, know, remember Jesus, you remember Jesus' answer? He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Translation, I would rather starve, because remember it had been 40 days since he'd eaten. 
I would rather starve than act in my own strength and not follow God. And if that's God's will for me to starve, then I will starve. We need to be willing to accept that that is God's agenda for us. That it includes suffering. Did not Jesus suffer for us? And he includes us not only in heirs with him, heirs of the kingdom, heirs in glory, but we also are heirs of his suffering because the world opposes us as it opposed him. Blessed are those who are persecuted, say all manner of evil things against you. Remember? So how are we going to flatten out part of this roller coaster? We have to be willing to accept the full agenda that God has for your day, for your life. It may not necessarily be the, the happy story that the blabbit grabbit people want you to believe it's going to be. That you're supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and powerful, and famous, and beautiful. Well, that lets me out. So we're going to have to accept all of this. But those who wait are the real remnant. Those are the ones who are willing to accept whatever God brings. They're the ones that are walking by faith. And, the sin, and look at John chapter 5. I'll try to get through this because we've got a few more things to do this morning. John chapter 5. Jesus set the pattern for walking by faith. Did you know that? Well, what does he need to walk by faith for? I mean, he's God. He's, a, he's fully man. He's fully God. What does he have to walk by faith? Because he is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one who shows us how this is done. And a leader goes in front of the people that are following him. Yes? And so he shows us how to do this. He lives as he is asking us to live. He's, he lives in a way by faith, by simple trust, the same way we live. The just shall live by faith. Even Jesus. He certainly is the just. So look at verse 19, chapter 5, verse 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these, the th these things the son does also in like manner. Look at verse 20. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgments are just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I do nothing on my own initiative. Jesus is letting the Father set the agenda for his day. When we are busy going, oh, I think I need to do this. I think, it, I think it needs to go this way. We're not allowing God to set the agenda. Now, I'm, I am certain that I'm the only one in this room who's dealt with that either. But this is really hard, Dave. It's really, really hard. Yes, it's really, really hard. Because we're so confused and so distracted, and we live in this earth suit that has not yet been redeemed, and it's always waging war against our mind and always trying to pull us in the direction of evil. While the inner man struggles with this conflict, it's hard. But that's why we end up on the roller coaster, isn't it? And so we have to learn to trust him. Because he says, and again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. We're included in all of this. Worshiping in the congregation, uh, walking with him, trusting in him. We're all doing this. He includes us in everything. We are heirs. We're above the angels. We worship in the congregation. We live by faith. We do nothing but what we see the Father doing. We suffer with him. We walk behind the author and finish of our faith because it tells us in John chapter 10 that the, the shepherd puts his sheep out and he goes in front of them. We walk behind Jesus. If we're getting ahead of him, then we're setting the agenda for our own day. And we're not looking for what is God doing here with this person in front of me? What is God doing in this situation that I'm in? What is he after? And it doesn't necessarily have to be, well, what is God trying to teach me? Maybe you're not the center of the universe. Maybe he wants you to be a catalyst 
Was that a shocking idea? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you, but maybe we're not. How many narcissists does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, all he has to do is hold on to it and the world revolves around him. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and the promise and he will make your paths straight. Not a roller coaster. Straight. Jesus said, I will build my church. Not me, not you, not us. It looks like we may end up with that. We've got some questions to answer. But, but that's not us building his church. They came to us and said, hey, we can't rent this. Would, would that work for you guys as a church? Okay, let's talk. <laughs> we do nothing in our own strength. I'm the vine. You are the branches. He who, ab now here's what sets up first. He who abides in me. Do you hear that? Setting, letting him set the agenda. Do you hear the worship? Do you hear the trust? Do you hear that? He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do Nothing. So how do we, let, let me bring this down to be really, really careful or really simple here. And then we'll, we'll move on. I want to have communion this morning too. Um, what does this look like when we're in prayer? I think this is very helpful. If I can do nothing in my own strength, then there's a couple of things I have to do. I have to think through. What is my life about? Whatever you do in word or deed, do you know the rest of the verse? Do all to the glory of, of God. All of it. Everything about your life is supposed to be glorifying God. If you have been raised up with him, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seek at the right hand of the Father. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. The whole purpose of our life is to glorify God. Okay, then just go out there and glorify God. <laughs> just that easy, just that quick. Um, how do I do that? One, you start with, that's the agenda God is setting. Whatever he sends in my life, the purpose of this it's not necessarily to test me, to teach me something, just, just to be ornery and make life hard for me. It's so he can glorify himself. Remember the blind man? Who sinned? His parents or this man? Neither. He's here to glorify God. And one of the most fun stories in the whole New Testament takes place. Doesn't even ask the guy, just spits, ew, makes mud, jams it in his face. Go wash. And a glorified God. I was blind, but now I see. Wow. It's about holiness. We start with my life. The agenda of my life is to glorify God. Holiness is about, we cannot overcome the flesh in the power of the flesh. Galatians says in 5.16 is walk by the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, right? We have to depend on him. Oh, but this is going to be so hard. This is going to be such drudgery. That's, that's what religion does. Religion is burdensome. But he loves you so. He loves you so. Have you ever heard of the fruit of the spirit? Love. Does love feel good? A little, a little soft on that one. Does, does love feel good? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience. That's worth a trip all by itself, isn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, general self-control. Does that feel bad? Walking with God as he sets the agenda of your life, that's what you're going to experience. That's a good life, is it not? Okay. But I have to depend 
upon God for everything if I am to glorify him. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We're asking you to pray. Part of prayer is you don't ask God, God, I I need you to help me to do this. Do you hear the emphasis is all wrong there? Um, You can help all you want. I can't do this. But you can do things through me. I'm asking you to do things through me. I can do nothing. But if you will abide in me and I abide in you, then I will bear much fruit. It's not because I'm the one that's doing it. It's because he is. So we stop asking, God, help me to do this. God, help me. God, make me that. God, make me this. No. I want you to glorify yourself through me. I cannot. Just ask him to do it. You already know that's what he wants to do. You may not see how that works out. But he does. And that's part of allowing him to have set the agenda for your day. Is this making sense? Okay. We're asking you to pray for three things, remember? A love for God's Son. Ask the Father to give you love for His Son. Ask the Father to give you a love for His Word. And one more thing. We're asking you to ask the Father to show you that He has something special for you every time you come. Every morning here, there's a reason you're here and it's something special He wants to do in your life. Can you pray those things? Because that will allow him to set some of the agenda for your day, will it not? You fall in love with Jesus. You fall in love with his word. And a lot of the good stuff is going to follow after that. Okay. Hate to rush, but uh, we'd like to have communion. Can the, the gentleman come up with, uh, we'll, we'll distribute the elements. Thank you, sir. Good thinking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yes. One of the things that we see in Acts chapter 2, while this is being passed out, one of the things we see in Acts chapter 2 is they, they kept feeling a sense of awe because they knew they were in God's presence. They knew he was doing something amazing all around them. And they understood that this God was so big, he paid for all the sins of the world with this one death on the cross. Whoa. And then 3,000 of them got saved in one afternoon. Maybe it was the morning. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. I guess it does, doesn't it? But anyways, in the morning. I want you to be looking to God because he has something for you and he wants to make your life something that is an adventure. It may be a hard one, but it will always be something that glorifies him. If you're walking with the spirit, it will always be something that glorifies him. And there is no higher purpose than that. Because he's made us one body. Grab your Bible, if you will, and we'll look at at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Very familiar. Remember, we we have the Lord's table, which has two parts. The bread and the cup and the wine. Verse 23 For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus and the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I want you to take this little piece of bread. And I want you to picture Jesus on the cross. And that moment where he said, It is finished. And I want you to break it. 
it is finished. It was all paid for. No more shame. No more shame. Eat the bread. We have a two-part communion because we have a two-part salvation. At first, sin had to be paid for. But just paying for sin didn't actually immediately help you much because we were still dead in our trespasses and sins. So there had to be new life given. As we know from the Old Testament, that that in the, in, the, in the blood, which is, this is a picture of that, remember? That the life was in the blood. And so we have this two-part communion because we have a two-part salvation. Our sin had to be paid for. We had a legal problem, but we also had a life problem. We had to be resurrected. So that's what this picture is. So there's no more shame. But at the same time now, God gives us the capacity because of the life now that's in us to live a life that glorifies him. He can glorify himself through you now because of the life that is in you. That's what this symbolizes. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Drink deeply. Father, for us the cup is sweet. For you it was bitter. Thank you for giving us life. We were dead and you found us in darkness and you brought us, transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness and put us into the kingdom of your beloved son and gave us redemption, full redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Thank you so much for what you've done for us and the power of the gospel to save and forgive and resurrect even someone like me and everyone else in this room. And we thank you for this in your precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. See you guys Wednesday. <laughs>